Okay, good morning, everyone. I, so, uh, as the, the MC basically said, my name is Sam. Uh, I'm a Google developer expert for uh, machine learning and deep learning. Um, I live in Singapore. I, I'm also a uh, co organizer of the TensorFlow and deep learning meetup there. Uh, with, with my other co organizer is speaking this afternoon. Um, I basically work on things to do with deep learning in relation to language and dialogue systems. Uh, and generative models. Uh, so I've done the whole startup thing a couple of times. I've built uh, two startup, two B2C startups that have had more than a million users. Uh, and the current startup that I'm working on is a startup called Red Dragon AI. So we basically do uh, deep learning consulting and prototyping. Um, we also do a bunch of research. We've had papers at, at NRIPS, uh, at ICML. We're a Google partner. We do a bunch of things with Google. Um, Google sponsors some of our research, uh, and we're, in, we're interested in things, products around uh, conversational computing, conversational AI, uh, natural voice generation, things called wave nets and stuff like that. Um, but also one of the things that we're really big on is education. So we do a bunch of sort of deep learning training courses in Singapore, and we also do sort of workshops around the world. We've done a, a bunch of in the States last year, uh, across Asia. We did a very small one here yesterday, uh, which uh, was really interesting to sort of see the level of people and what people were interested in. Um, uh, <laughs> เดี๋ยวไลไลปีมากเลยอ่าเรื่องบางทีไปแน่ใจไอ้อาจจะกําลังใช้เทคโนโลยีใหม่ของเรดแดกอนเอไอที่ I, and it is, you know, it's really amazing that how many sort of breakthroughs that we're getting in this sort of thing. I, and a lot of the questions I get are things like, you know, how do I, uh, what's the best way to learn deep learning? What's the easiest? What's the fastest? What's the most efficient? All this sort of thing. Um, how much math do I need to know? What sort of programming languages should I pick? And so this is a presentation that I've sort of put together to answer a lot of those things for people who are just starting out and to show you a little bit about sort of what it can do and, and what, you know, what's available. So often I ask people questions back, well, what do you want to use it for? I, because it's not the solution for everything. I, and you, know, you want to kind of make sure that you've basically tried some other things first, probably for your problem, and then you come to this kind of thing. So I, in this talk, I'm going to basically sort of give you a 10,000 foot view of uh, deep learning and things related to deep learning. And I'm going to show you some of the components, and that it's actually quite easy to understand some of these things. And I'm going to show you, uh, you know, some of the resources that you can use and take away to basically build uh, you know, your understanding and hopefully start building stuff in deep learning. So what is deep learning? First of all, well, if you ask the media, you get something like this. So these are both pictures that have been taken from uh, articles related to uh, a, a paper called AutoML, or a technique called AutoML. Uh, and basically it got reported, I think the one on the right is from the UK, that it was basically Google's AI is building AI, we're all doomed. Um, and we got, we've got a lot of people like you know, uh, Elon Musk that sort of take this myth and, and run with it as well. Um, that's not correct. This is not what it's about. And another thing people think is that it's basically about something to do with the brain. And while this analogy is kind of good for explaining parts of it, uh, really we're not building a brain, right? Contrary to what a lot of people think and maybe even what some scientists will try and claim, what we're doing is basically building al algorithms that do mathematics. So if we look at the uh, sort of the field of AI, I, you know, we tend to look at AI, the, the term AI, as being a marketing term much more than being a scientific term. I, but you could sort of look at AI as being, you know, getting machines to solve things that in the past really only related to, you know, human intelligence. I, the subfield of that would be machine learning, which has been around for a long, long time. Subfield of that would be neural networks, uh, which have also been around for a long, long time. I, and then the subfield of that would be deep learning, which is basically just meaning deeper neural networks. 
Uh, in fact, if we look at it, uh, deep learning is just a subfield of neural networks. Uh, like I said, neural networks have been around for a long time. We're looking at something like 30 years plus. Uh, they really have only, even though they've been around for so long, they've only become viable in the last, say, you know, nine or 10 years uh, due to massive increases of compute and massive increases of data uh, that are out there. Um, and pretty much deep learning is the thing that's behind the majority, uh, you know, actually almost probably you know, 95% at least, of things that people call AI out there. I, so this is a, you know, a real sort of common thing. Another term that I really like is, uh, it, it came from a guy called Andre Kapathy. I, and so Andre is basically the, uh, the head of AI at Tesla now. But he talks about this term of software 2.0. And I think this is a really nice analogy of starting to think about you know, this kind of, uh, these kind of neural networks, this kind of deep learning as being software 2.0. So if we, if we look at sort of like traditional programming was all about you would basically have, uh, you would have the data, you would write a set of rules, usually some sort of conditional logic, something like that, and then it would output your answers. Whereas software 2.0, we look at it more as like, okay, if I've got some answers and I've got some data, then I can get the algorithm to write the rules, or I can get the program to come up with the rules. So this is you know, creating uh, massive breakthroughs in so many different fields, just because, for example, to write conditional logic for how to do, uh, you know, to do uh, automatic speech recognition is unbelievably hard. In fact, it's impossible, right? I, and there have been techniques around that have worked you know, kind of well, but definitely something like deep learning come along, came along and just blew all of those out of the water. Uh, and this is why it's sort of the state of the art for things. Um, another thing to understand with deep learning is, so this is actually a famous model from, uh, from Google. Uh, and if you look over here on the left is the input, over on the right uh, are the outputs. Uh, this is an example of what we mean when we talk about deep. These are the layers that you're seeing this go through. Uh, and sort of depending on how you count these layers, you know, the, the, the number of layers will, will sort of change. Um, you know, at, at a minimum, we're sort of looking at around 17 plus layers. If you count all the different nodes, as some of people saw in the workshop yesterday, we had like 313 layers or something like that when we actually sort of printed this model out to look at how deep it was. I, but the key thing is that you know, this is a massive amount of computation needed to do this. When this model was created, which is probably about four or five years ago, it used to take Google about a week to train, uh, and would cost about $30,000 in compute to train this model. I, it was something that uh, you know, at the time was definitely state of the art. It's certainly not state of the art now. But one of the cool things is a lot of these models, like this one, is called Inception version 3, you can download for free now. You can download all the weights from that, and you can use it uh, for your own tasks. And this has happened with many of these sort of models. Uh, you know, my partner's going to talk about some stuff that like, literally was released two weeks ago, and there are already weights and versions that you can download uh, this afternoon. So you, uh, make sure to check out his talk on, on convolutional neural networks. All right, so what can deep learning do? Well, let's look at some of the things it can do. So the first thing is classification. I, this is where we're basically just dividing things into classes, and we're trying to basically work out, uh, in this case, what's a blueberry muffin, what's a chihuahua. Funny thing is, this is actually much easier for an algorithm to do than for a human to do. All right, so we should show this as like a, you know, a, com a comic example, but really it's actually something unbelievably simple for a, a convolutional neural network to do. The next kind of thing uh, are things like uh, object detection and segmentation models. So segmentation models are really also a classification model, but now we're doing classification at a pixel level. So these are the models that are driving all the things related to perception in self-driving cars. Being able to, if you look at this, you can see that it's coloring in what is a car, it's coloring in what is a human, what is a traffic light. Uh, and when you, the self-driving models uh, will basically you know, break things out to lots of different classes and color in every single pixel to know ex exactly what it is. Is that something uh, that is, you know, that the cast to be worried about crashing into? Is it the right way to go? That kind of thing. 
Um, image captioning models have become quite popular too. So this is probably one of the reasons you could say why Google's happy to give you free Google Photos. Uh, is that it allows them to get a lot of data of photos or to, you know, and then to be able to sort of look at some of this stuff uh, of people writing captions on it uh, and then generate models that can look at this picture and say, oh, okay, this is a person flying a kite on a beach. And the interesting thing is we can't see the string between the, the, you know, the, the human and the kite, but the model's seen enough uh, examples to sort of, sort of deduct that, okay, this is what's going on here. The person's looking at the kite. The probability of them flying the kite is high in this case. Um, some other kinds of models. So this is some work I did about two, two and a half years ago now. Uh, and these are generative models. So here we're putting in some input and we're using a deep neural network to basically predict some kind of output. So the one on the top is a model called super resolution. I, and this basically takes in an image, very low resolution image, uh, and then you, that's on the left. And the one in the middle is what it actually predicts that that person will look like. And the one on the right is what the ground truth is what the actual person looks like in real life. Um, I tell people when I showed this to my wife, my wife was like, oh, that's nothing special. They do that on CSI all the time. <laughs> so I had to explain to her, no, that's fake, right? This is actually the real thing. <laughs> um, the one below that is basically a colorization model. So it's basically taking in a black and white photo. It's a very similar kind of architecture. Uh, it's basically taking in a black and white photo, but this time it's generating a color version of it. And if you look at the, the ground truth, we can actually see that it's kind of got like a hot light, that yellow light in there. And the model sees enough examples to sort of work out that, okay, that camera has not done a good job at, catching, at capturing the lighting in that situation. So it actually predicts the background as being the white rather than the white with the yellow light on it. This, these are the kind of models that you're starting to see appear in uh, mobile phones a lot, whether it be you know, Apple's mobile phones or Android, uh, Huawei, et cetera, using a lot of these models to improve photography uh, and, and make, you know, all the sort of beauty cam stuff. Um, next thing is a project that I, I worked on, uh, whoa, project I worked on recently, uh, doing OCI uh, for Thai stuff, for, for Thai ID cards. All right. So this basically uh, can just look at a, a Thai ID card and then work out you know, what are the key details on it, being able to uh, lift, them, uh, lift them off it, uh, can make a prediction whether the person's male or female, I, can sort of do some collaboration or, you know, on checking some of the data and stuff like that. So these models are becoming more and more useful uh, for, for lots of different uh, situations. And so uh, I was actually came up uh, to Bangkok earlier, the, earlier last week now, um, and, and one of the things I got asked was, well, you know, this is really cool, but would you be able to do it for Thai handwriting? And the thing I wonder is like, well, okay, I don't know if we could do it for time handwriting, but you know what? I'm bored one night, let me spend a few hours trying it, and sure enough, it works pretty well for time handwriting as well. So you can see that by building some sort of system with enough data, you can start to build something that can you know, take even uh, things like handwriting and turn that into, uh, you know, digitize it for, which turns out to be very useful for a lot of companies. Um, sequence models are another really popular sort of model. Uh, so, these are basically used for a lot of things like NLP and uh, things related to time series and stuff like that. If you think about text, is basically just a sequence of either words or characters. Uh, and there's a lot of interesting work going on in, with this sort of sequence sort of work. So um, there are lots of different models. In fact, there's whole bunches of them that I haven't you know, even had a chance to sort of cover. Neural machine translation models, uh, language models, uh, speech recognition stuff, Q&A systems, uh, artistic, you know, there's a whole bunch of cool artistic stuff, anomaly detection. A lot of this stuff is suddenly becoming state of the art. In fact, we're sort of seeing that uh, domain expertise plus deep learning generally equals state of the art for almost any task that, you know, that we throw. There's a few exceptions, but for most tasks that we throw at it. So to give you some examples from Google, uh, this is a, a really old picture now. This is uh, an example of, uh, Google has its own repo system. Uh, and in the, the folders in the repo system, this is, shows the number of folders that basically contain code related to, uh, to, um, deep learning, to machine learning and deep learning networks. And you can see that that basically was just on an exponential curve. Since then, it's gone to you know, sort of double what it is here. Uh, 
and it's just you know gone up and up and up. In fact, I would say that uh, every product inside of Google now uh, uses machine learning, uh, and quite a high amount of them use deep learning in some way, shape, or form. Things like your language translation is using. Uh, you know, is, is basically has massively increased the state of the art uh, for uh, being able to do this through using deep learning technologies. Um, what statistical, you know, machine translation was doing before has been surpassed uh, a long time ago with, with deep learning technologies. So, okay, you want to learn this stuff. So, everyone's going to try and tell you that it's really hard, right? I'm going to tell you it's not that hard. I, really, everything breaks down, like much of machine learning, into sort of four key parts. You've got some form of input and output to the model. You've got some form of architecture or sort of a connectivity pattern of the model. Right? Then you've basically got some form of loss function and, and some form of optimizer. So you can think of these as being like the Lego bricks. And you just sort of assemble these Lego bricks you know, in code uh, to try and get the right kind of model to, for your particular problem. I, and let me sort of explain what's going on here. So you've got some sort of input, and usually the out, you've got the output, right? Meaning the, the labels or the answers. I, and what you'll do is you'll basically pass that through a bunch of hidden layers or an architecture that what it basically does is uh, run a bunch of computations on it, and it updates a bunch of variables. So just like you could have you know, uh, your conditional logic where you're basically checking you know, if, uh, if this person, I want to decide if this person's short or tall, are they greater than 180 centimeters? All right, if they're greater than 180 centimeters, I'm going to classify them as tall, right? But that's using one variable to do it. I, in deep learning, I, we basically are using, you know, at a minimum, tens of thousands, usually in the millions, and then for some of the really cutting edge stuff, we're using in the billions of variables. So uh, some of the, the latest models that we, we've been working on you know, use well over a billion parameters, well over 1.5 billion parameters. Um, so OK, it goes through that. And then basically, you come out the other side. And now you take some sort of loss. right? So for those of you so those of you who've done machine learning, this will be you know, quite uh, common to you. If you haven't, it's just basically looking at the output looking at what the model predicted, and then working out, OK, how close is it to what I want it to actually predict? Right. And then we use some sort of optimization to go back and update those, those variables to get what it is that we want to do. And we do it in lots of passes right, over the data. And as we're doing that, that's, you know, this update basically causes uh, the model to sort of learn a bunch of things. So if you look here, I've just broken out. This is the same sort of diagram. I've just broken it out so you can see the different layers of the architecture. And to understand that each layer has a bunch of what we call weights and biases. But you can really think of those are the variables that get changed as the model learns. Uh, and they get updated over time. They get updated, you know, uh, Many, many times, right? Every batch of data they go through, they get updated. As you, if you're training for thousands of epochs, they're going to be updated, you know, probably uh, often even millions of times. All right, so let's look at these four things and break them down a bit. So the first one is model inputs and outputs. So obviously you can't, or well, maybe not obviously, but uh, you can't uh, put things that are not numbers into one of these things, right? You have to be able to, to vectorize or get some sort of numerical uh, representation of what it is that you're doing to put into one of these things. So there's a number of ways of doing that. So for vectorized data, that could be you could have sort of continuous data or categorical data that you basically uh, are looking at uh, and deciding, OK, how are you going to put that into your model? That might be just straight vectors you know, of stuff. For things like images, uh, it turns out that images are actually just all numbers anyway, right? I'm sure many of you know the sort of RGB format of having a red channel, a green channel, a blue channel. So in that case, we've basically just got a height by width by number of channels matrix, right? Or a set of matrices. That's basically a tensor of those. I, and things like it turns out that things like audio, you can just convert to an image as a spectrogram or something like that and use that as your input data. Uh, same holds true for things like medical scans. Uh, and it's amazing that some of these techniques uh, 
the same exact architecture will work on you know, many, many different types of problems and all you're changing is the way that you vectorize or the way that you get that, that information into a numerical format. Sequences is another thing you can get into that. There can be uh, text, you, know, you can basically allocate a number for each word in a vocabulary, you could allocate a number for each character. Uh, and try doing things like that. Speech is also uh, something that we deal with in a sequential sort of way. And, and uh, also things like videos end up being a sort of sequential version of the, the same thing that we had before. So this leads us to the next sort of part, which is once we've got our models, once we've got sorry, the, the model inputs and outputs, uh, then we need some architectures. And so there are, I would say there are four main architectures now that exist. The first one is, is sort of your fully connected networks, also known as uh, multi-layer perceptrons. I, the, the second one, and, and they're, they're generally good for, for things like structured data, that kind of stuff. The second one, with the animation going on at the moment, uh, is a convolutional neural network. I, so these tend to work really well for images. They also tend to work, can work really well for, for text and for other things as well, if you treat them the right way. They actually look at the data in a, in a different sort of way. Um, the third type is basically a recurrent network. So this is now looking at sequences of data. So we're putting in whole sequences and we're often predicting out multiple sequences. Just like neural machine translation, that's basically uh, putting in a sequence in one language and predicting a sequence out in a different language. <coughs> and the last one is definitely the newest one, is a model called a transformer model. So this also has a sort of encoder-decoder architecture, I, but this is definitely getting the state of the art for things like neural machine translation now, for things like uh, language generation, uh, a whole b bunch of different things. Uh, and for, also for things like uh, ASR, automatic uh, speech recognition, um, and, and even things like some of the things uh, like OCR and stuff like that can be, you know, can benefit from this kind of model as well. So these are the four architectures. And you'll find that most, you know, probably 95% of all models will make, you know, maybe even higher than that, will make use of either one of these or a combination of these uh, in a certain format. All right? So that there's not a lot that you need to learn in this sense, right? You've basically just got to start learning what these, these architectures are. The, the third building block is your loss function. So this is like I described before, this is basically just doing a, some sort of comparison uh, and basically comparing the labels to what you uh, predicted and then doing some sort of summation and working out the mean or working out you know, some sort of averaging or something like that. Um, one thing I want to show you though, is that, the, okay, this is quite a simple loss function, but if we do things in, uh, in mathematical notation, often the loss function, you're gonna read a paper and you're gonna go, whoa, this math is just like, you know, uh, this, this, this is like beyond what I can do. You're gonna find that in the frameworks, it's like one line of code. You literally just pick the, the, uh, the loss function that you want, and I've put an example there uh, from TensorFlow 2, I, and basically that's just picking you know, a, one particular loss function and then use it. So you don't always need to know the mathematics behind everything, especially at the start. Now, of course, it's gonna help you later on to understand some of these things, but I see far too many uh, coders and programmers who don't have a, a really strong math background get stopped by thinking, oh, I need to understand every optimization function or every loss or, you know, uh, you don't. Because a lot of those things are just gonna be one line of code. Just as loss functions are like that, optimization functions are also like that. I, so this is basically uh, showing a bunch of different optimizers, I, and they are all trying to converge to a, uh, to a local minima. I, they're, the way that they are, uh, you know, the, the way that they do that algorithmically is different for each one. But the thing you all you need to know, at the, especially at starting out, is just this, this is one line of code that you can basically just create your optimizer and then you're gonna pass that into your network. All right? So don't be sort of intimidated by thinking, uh, and I, I've seen sort of like a lot of online courses where they really try to intimidate people, well, you need to understand this math and you need to, ah, it's, it, the, half the time you're just gonna use something off the shelf anyway. Right, that's so, you know, in, in fact, I would say probably 90% of the models you're gonna make, unless you're making really advanced stuff, are gonna be just using stock standard losses, stock standard optimizers. All right, and eventually you come up with something like this. 
So I, th this is obviously a, a model that's basically I, predicting out uh, two classes, whether something's a cat, whether something's a dog. And it's just doing the inference here of going through, those weights have been trained now, uh, those variables, weights and biases have been trained, I, and it's basically now just going through and, and uh, putting it all together. I, these kind of models are very simple to see. As those of you who were in the workshop yesterday saw that you know, in literally 20 minutes we could teach you how to make something like this, and you could then go and use that for your own data. Right? It's something that can certainly be done. All right, programming languages. Well, this is a simple one, right? Uh, most of the stuff is Python, hence why I'm here. I, the, by far, all the, the frameworks uh, are geared around Python. Uh, a lot of the you know, stuff that we use is things like NumPy, like Pandas, uh, for doing the pre-processing and stuff like that. Um, some other cool stuff that really makes this stuff easy would be things like Jupyter Notebooks, um, also Google Colab. I encourage you, you know, I, 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 unfortunately I was teaching the workshop yesterday, I saw there was a, an advanced talk about Colabs, which I think is really cool. Um, Colab originally was an a, a internal project inside of Google Brain for, for researchers. They realized how cool it was, they basically made it pu public, then they decided to give away a free GPU with that, and then nowadays you can even get access to a free TPU with that. So for learning, you shouldn't have to spend any money on you know, cloud stuff. Just go and use something like Colab, and you can basically learn how to do all this stuff for free. I, that brings me to frameworks, and there's lots of them. Uh, I've put a few up here, uh, and you know some of these frameworks uh, are still sort of valid, or, or you know still around, I should say, rather than being valid. Um, many, some like you know Theano was a really big framework uh, years ago, has now been discontinued. But I'm going to tell you that really you just want to focus on two frameworks, so that. <laughs> The only ones that count is basically TensorFlow 2. Now I'm going to say, if you're starting to learn, this is the case, right? It's TensorFlow 2, and I'll explain why in a bit. And the other one is PyTorch. So both of these frameworks are, have been, you know, are much, much simpler than sort of Theano and things like that were uh, years ago. I, People have learned from the mistakes of what didn't work or what wasn't very Pythonic, for example, uh, and now been able to update that, you know, do this. Now, the big thing I stress here is TensorFlow 2, all right? So I'm going to talk about TensorFlow. Don't use TensorFlow 1, <laughs> right? TensorFlow 1 has a whole bunch of weird things uh, about building graphs, and that means having sessions, that means uh, having queues, having all this sort of weird stuff. That stuff that at the end of the day, that's not what you're trying to do, right? You're trying to build some sort of deep learning model. You don't want to care about high performance computing uh, and how to do that and how to do some sort of distribution strategy or something like that. I, TensorFlow 2 has fixed the majority of these things. So as, we, you know, as I'm talking now, TensorFlow 2 has just gone into beta. Um, the beta is actually very stable. I, we should see a release candidate in the not too distant you know, future. I, and TensorFlow 2 has really I, taken a lot of feedback on what was wrong with TensorFlow 1 and tr you know, tried to fix the majority of those things. Um, one of those big things is the introduction of Keras, which I'll talk about in a second. The other cool thing with TensorFlow is that uh, it's basically an ecosystem. So with TensorFlow, you're not just getting the actual TensorFlow you know, deep learning framework. You also have access to things like TensorBoard, uh, TF Lite, if you want to convert a model and then take that model and put it on a mobile phone easily. It's very simple to do now. It's getting you know, simpler by the day. We have TensorFlow JS which is basically where we can take a model that you've trained, uh, convert it to basically uh, you know, a JavaScript payload to then run in a browser or something like that. Um, TFX, so uh, TFX is basically building whole pipelines for doing this stuff with a whole bunch of different features beyond just the, the actual deep learning side of it. I, and then we've got things, new, new sort of stuff that's really interesting, which is sort of coming out of Google uh, 
uh, as sort of like, sort of, I, I will sort of say side projects or interesting projects. Things like TF probability is using uh, Bayesian statistics with deep learning to do a lot of interesting stuff. TF agents is doing reinforcement learning and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, and TF ranking. So it turns out a lot of problems are actually ranking problems. Uh, and Google's now released a, a library for working with that. Tensorflow 2 is that basically, as of Tensorflow 2, they now love Keras, right? Uh, a lot of people have loved Keras for a long time. Uh, so I, I'm curious, how many people know Keras? Or, I see some, yeah, decent amount of hands, right? So why Keras? Keras is a, is a great high-level API. So the creator of Keras actually now works at Google. Uh, Keras was actually created as an API sort of specification with multiple implementations for, for different deep learning backends. Uh, the, the cool thing with it, though, is you have access to a lot of these pre-built models that you can just download and, and use to do things. Um, we've also got uh, the, the other cool thing with sort of Keras code is it's very easy to go and find something on GitHub where someone has done something like that before. So TF Keras, you're getting a fully optimized version of Keras that's built into TensorFlow 2. Uh, this allows you to take advantage of things like the accelerators, the customizing with subclassing, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, so TensorFlow 2 now looks like this. We've basically got a big uh, Python front end uh, with uh, TF Data and TF Keras as the high-level APIs. But then you've got, you know, all your code gets converted to a thing called XLA, so it can run on multiple accelerators or um, on uh, a bunch of different things. All right, so the, the, sort of the last main thing I wanted to talk about is if you're starting out, there are a few main paths. So I added one just before. So it's actually the four main paths. So these are like, uh, these are the things that I find that a lot of people ask me, well, I'm interested in computer vision. What should I learn when? So I would say that these are the sort of things that I would say for each sort of thing. If you want to do computer vision, start out with image classification, use uh, transfer learning with pre-made ImageNet models, do some object detection. Then you're starting to get into more advanced stuff like UNETs for segmentation, uh, and then sort of uh, image labeling or stuff like that, CNNs plus RNNs. If you're interested in text, you want to start out with some sort of text classification. So there are models for doing that, simple models for doing that for, for with LSTMs, with CNNs. You want to then get into uh, embeddings. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different sorts of embeddings. Uh, there's a really nice, I think it's tie to vec now, it's called that for if, if you're using uh, stuff with Thai. Um, tagging models, uh, and then fine tuning language models. This is sort of like, you know, uh, become a de, de facto standard for a lot of this stuff now. Uh, and then look at something like language generation. I, the structured path one, I, you want to basically look at sort of stuff with uh, MLPs for a really basic sort of starting out. Then you want to look at things called wide and deep models. So this is, these don't get a lot of publicity, but they're used a lot uh, inside of Google they, they, and, and for a lot of other companies as well. They generate a lot of cool things. In sense of all, you can use what's called TF feature columns to do a lot of this to make it really simple to do. You then want to look at sort of, you know, feature crosses and custom uh, creations and then embeddings. Uh, especially for things like time series, you want to be using embeddings for that. Last one I'll, I'll put up is generative models. Um, so this is one people ask me more. So generative models are a lot harder. You want to start out with sort of probably doing all the vision stuff and text stuff first, then look at autoregressive models, uh, and then things like um, variational autoencoders and GANs, generative adversarial networks. Um, and to, you know, there's a lot of cool GANs out there nowadays. Uh, some from uh, like Big GAN from DeepMind, uh, Style GAN from NVIDIA. Don't start with something like those. Those are very complicated models. Uh, you know, if you're just beginning out trying to build something like that, you're not gonna, you know, gonna run into a bunch of problems. All right, some books. So uh, people always ask me for resources. Okay, these are four books that I would recommend that I think are really fantastic. Uh, the first one is written by a friend of ours, Aurel Geron. Um, he's also a, a Google development uh, d developer expert for machine learning. Um, then we've got the, the, the Francois book, who is actually the creator of Keras, the, the deep learning with Python. Um, then, uh, which ones have we got? Okay, Grokking Deep Learning, Andrew Trask. Uh, Andrew's based at, at DeepMind, uh, has also got a big passion for educating people. And the last one would, would, is kind of like the, the sort of early Bible for this sort of stuff, uh, which was written by Bengio and Ian Goodfellow, the creator of GANs. Uh, and, and also Aaron Corvell. Um, courses, if you're interested in courses, come to Singapore. <laughs> uh, we're running a bunch of courses in Singapore. 
Uh, and we've got, you know, uh, we generally do them every month or two in Singapore. Uh, and then the thing we talked about uh, was that, okay, well, if people are interested, in, is there enough people interested in doing in Thailand, then maybe we look at doing something like this in Thailand too. So we put up a bit.ly link for a, a form that if you are interested in doing something like this, um, just go and fill out the form, and if we end up doing something here, we'll let you know that you know, we, we plan to do it. Uh, okay, the last thing to sort of finish up, I would say is, remember, have a clear application of what it is you want to build. Realize that this field is too big to know everything. Um, if, you don't, if you don't understand one person's explanation of something, just keep finding other people to explain it to you. Eventually, you will find one that just clicks with you and you sort of get it. Uh, and remember, go back to the basics. Every model that I showed you earlier, those, you know, the, even those advanced ones, all have the same fourth key building blocks, the inputs and outputs, the architectures, the loss, optimizer. For my conclusion, I would say that you know, everyone who succeeds learns deep learning a different way from my experience, um, and everyone who fails, fails in the same way. They give up. All right. So just don't give up. Keep going. With that, thank you, and I'm happy to take some questions. All right. All right. Thank you very much.